Hi, I'm Legs McNeil, and welcome to part two of my interview with Nicholas Schreck. Actually, it's part three, because before we had part one and two, and now we're having part three. How are you today, Nicholas? I am very happy to be here. Hey. Thank you for inviting me Thank to you your for secret lair. Your secret lair in Legsville, I, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is my first international trip since the COVID disaster, so... I'm honored to uh, share this moment with you. Well, I'm so glad you're here. And we're talking today about Nicholas's new book, The Manson File, which, do you want to explain? This is like 30 years in the making. 33 years in 30. the making, on and off, trying to avoid it, but the curse of Manson yes. kept bringing me back in. So this is the third and final edition of the Manson File. When did when did the first Manson File come the out? First, in the eighties. The first one came out in nineteen eighty eight. Uh huh. As a result of Charlie being disgusted with the book Manson in his own words, which wasn't in his own words, which was not in his own words, and that was his problem with it, exactly as his problem with Dennis Wilson changing his song. Yeah. Yeah. He was very concerned with his words being portrayed accurately. So he asked me, well, why don't you do Manson really in his own words? And that became the Manson file number one in 1988. Did you tape him? Uh, sometimes, but mostly I took notes. But we also, he sent me tons of written material that had never been published before. Like he, he, had, he had never really had an opportunity to print some of his written prose, for instance, a, a excellent, like, magical realism, semi-biographical writing called The Black White Bus, and he contributed oh, these yeah. writings yeah. and texts, and that was the first so time... So he actually wrote The Black White Bus? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't know yeah. that. And basically, that was the first time in 1988 that people got a chance to see what he really thought, what yeah. his philosophy actually yeah. was, yeah. as opposed to the caricature that yeah, Bugliosi yeah. and Sanders and the mass media had presented. And he was happy with it. He noted that he got a more intelligent uh, demographic of people writing to him. And then he wanted to do another book called, the, he, he because it was successful, that he wanted to call The Mind of Charles Manson. Mm -hmm. And he, I describe it in this edition of the book. He had a very specific idea of a gold cover with a lion's head on it, and just the mind of Charles Manson, and we discussed his philosophy in great detail. And, and he had a coherent philosophy. He was not a raving lunatic. He, he had a, a belief system, whether you agree with it yeah, or not, is subjective. Yeah. But so, and that, we didn't ultimately end up doing that, but that, a lot of that book ended up in the wizard mm -hmm. chapter of the 2011 edition of this book mm -hmm. and this new edition. And I have to point out too that, you know, when most people hear the name Charles Manson, they think it's gonna be a true crime book. Yeah. But this is much more than a true crime book. It's, a, it's an analysis of the totality of the Manson phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So it begins with his philosophy. Mm -hmm. it, it gets into his music, which has been, you know, really hard, only regarded as a footnote to the crimes. Yeah, yeah. So I deal with his music seriously yeah. for the first time. Yeah. I deal with his philosophy, his spiritual teaching, his political views or his meta-political views, um, the way the media has treated him and created this myth. Did he feel badly the way he kind of was very uncooperative when he was in the studio? Did, did, did he feel like he blew it? Uh, yes, or? he, in fact, and some, some, you know, he was very prideful. And I think my impression was, t I talked to him many times about his recordings with Terry Melcher yeah. and the Beach Boys, and it took years to get him to open up about it because I believe he was a bit chagrined that he fucked up, basically. Yeah, that yeah. he Because uh, when he was in the studio, correct me if I'm wrong, if an engineer said, hey, you know, you want to put the microphone a little closer to your mouth or something, right. he would take that as a... a personal a, slight. Like, yeah. yeah. Would, no, uh, and having worked with Charlie in, you know, ma making this film, Charles Manson yeah. Superstar, and working on the book with three him. different times yeah. with him, he, you know, he was cooperative, but he didn't want any advice. Yeah. And when you go into the recording studio, the engineer's in charge of the session, yeah. and they're doing their best... Yeah 
to and make you sound comfort. good. Yeah, right. exactly. And he he couldn't do that. He yeah. could, and I I think a part of the problem was actually I think he had very severe ADHD, what would be called ADHD, ADHD. now, yeah. and I think he was very restless, yeah. and you know, and he was very thin-skinned. He would he would he would be insulted yeah, few, by few, suggestions, few. but you know so. I think he had very mixed feelings about it. He claimed, well, I didn't really want a recording career, but I, yeah, I believe he would have rather been a successful yeah, musician than a, than a famous cult leader, yeah. frankly. <laughs> in either event, I take his music seriously for the first time in any book. I take his philosophy, his political ideas, and also the, the subtitle explains what the book is, Myth and Reality of an Outlaw okay. Shaman. So much of what we know about this person is folklore, yeah, legend, yeah. myth, yeah, yeah. and even the people involved with it tend to repeat the bullshit yeah, legendary, as know, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't, I mean, you should talk a little bit about how much research you did into this subject and, and uh, you know, what you learned about it. Well, I did. Because you came at it too from the musical perspective. I did 10 years of really solid research and, um, Ten years before that, of off and on doing stuff, I did the porn book in the middle of that, and did some of the interviews. Right, so, but you, you know, you interviewed a lot of people who nobody else ever did before yeah, or after. Yeah. What did you discover about the musical side of Charlie or his dealings with the music world that surprised you or that that contradicted the legend? Basically, that he was kept shooting himself in the foot. You mm -hmm. know, when someone would make suggestions, you know, you know move the microphone this way or right. do this or do that. It's just what you said, right. you know, that he took suggestions as an insult. Right. You know, the Ramones went in and, you know, basically made their first album for 6,500. We're in right. like less than a week, I think. Right. So for him well, to he have had this, these golden opportunities. Exactly. I was, yeah. you know, he, he, he really had, you know, he had Dennis, he had the Beach Boys, he had Brian Wilson, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and he, fucked it up right you know i was kind of appalled by that right you know and then i learned a lot more I, well i also and think, talking talking to the people right um was much different than reading about them or you know sitting in the same room with people who were like you who sat down with charlie and knew him and talked to him and right and until this book came out there really was no other book that was truthful about manson no you know, you know? no yeah so. Yeah, and I also have to point out, people have the idea, as I've said before, that because I knew him and because I liked him and yeah. was friendly with him, that I'm that I accepted everything he said as gospel, <laughs> which I certainly didn't. Yeah, yeah. We argued. Uh, yeah. If he said something that wasn't true, I would call him on it. Yeah, and I researched what he told me. Yeah, you did a lot of research. Yeah, yeah. a ton of research. Yeah. So yeah, this is the conclusion of 33 years of working with him, knowing him, and. Uh, you know, it's my final word on the subject, at least in written form. I also, what I was working on was was doing, contrasting the way the music industry worked with the way Ch Charlie worked, mm -hmm. you know. And Charlie kind of broke into this world that was the highest strata of society. You know, everyone wants to be in Hollywood and be a movie star. Right, that's the aristocracy of our time. Yeah, exactly. And that he got so close to this and also that everyone put down his music and said oh he wasn't really that good and you know but if you listen to demo tapes of anybody they're not great they're right. not you know well, but, and also they're lying actually these people did admire his music yeah. and they they yeah. thought highly of him and they put a lot of time and effort and money and energy into if charlie had the wrecking crew behind him too he would right. have sounded he might, might right. have had a hit record right you know? well that that tape is out there i mean yeah. of course you know he recorded with the wrecking crew and he did yes uh, oh yeah with mike d did yeah. he record with Mike? oh Pizza? yes 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 and and i mean terry melcher produced enough songs to, to I make have, an I, album i have never heard yeah the record well that's that's covered the, in the is, book do you have you heard? No, 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 nobody's heard it for years. Uh -huh. I've heard people who described it. When you asked me how did he feel about it, Charlie said that that he felt Melcher oversweetened and overproduced his music, and he wasn't really satisfied. Well, of course with, he would. Right, enough. and and apparently Melcher felt like it wasn't polished enough, enough. so yeah. they didn't really agree. Yeah, 
And that is what led to what you're referring to, is to Mike Deasy, yeah. Terry Melcher suggested. Well, you... No, you, it was you Dean, can, Dean Torrance of yeah. Jan and Dean. Right. Because um, Mike Deasy had just gotten this mobile recording unit, so they sent Mike Deasy out to record right. Charlie. Right, and that led to this disaster where mm -hmm. Charlie or somebody gave Mike Deasy, who was one of the greatest session musicians at the time, playing he was with Elvis, Elvis and everybody. Glenn Campbell, yeah, the, the Beach Boys, everybody, the, the monkeys, monkeys, yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every hit song well, you've heard from it, that period has Mike, Mike Deasy. And so. Charlie or somebody gave DZ some acid, which mm. he'd never had before. <laughs> he freaked out. He thought Charlie was the devil, apparently attacked him with a pitchfork okay. and other farming equipment, <laughs> and he was beaten up. Terry Melcher with had other to... farming equipment. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, apparently that was June of 1969. And Charlie often referred to this, and I get into this in the book, as some kind of turning point that led to the murder. So I don't know exactly that the conflict that occurred with DZ really? somehow really? had some, but he was very cryptic. So UFOs. Yeah. Um, I've had many experiences with UFOs. Um, I have no doubt that the phenomenon exists. exists. I don't claim to know what it is, yeah. but I will relate the most recent anecdote, which was completely persuasive and convincing where, where, to me. Where were you? I was in my office in the forest in Berlin, on the outskirts of Berlin, and Sorry. it was around midnight, and I was standing up looking over my desk, and my window looks out over the top of the trees of the forest across the street. and. It was, I remember that it was specifically the witching hour, midnight. And I saw a shining bronzish gold disc, very small, and it immediately went shoop and became quite large and was hovering there over the forest. And I don't get easily frightened, yeah. but it was right. shocking. Yeah. It yeah. was startling. Yeah. And I had the impression of an intelligence watching me from it, and not a human intelligence. A superior intelligence was definitely observing me, though there were no windows on this circular globular yeah. object. Yeah. There was not in any way a human aircraft. Right. There was nothing. It was totally smooth mm -hmm. and floating and hovering there. And I could tell it was looking at me. Mm -hmm. And Zena, how far? How far would you say it was from the window? It was yeah. across the street from me and hovering over the trees. It was close. Oh, wow, that's close. Very yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. And, and threatening. It felt threatening. So, and like I said, I've, I've been in all kinds of uh, bizarre incidents that haven't terrified me. But yeah. that was like hit some animal nerve. Like this yeah. is beyond my ken. And I turned the light out to look at it better. And it stayed there. And then Zena was next door in her art studio. Yeah. This was years ago, so I picked up a telephone and called her quietly yeah. and said, look out the window yeah. and tell me what you see. And she did, and she said, just like, <gasps> yeah, I mean, the no words. Yeah. And she said, yeah, you see it, yeah, she yeah. did. And very rarely do people have this experience together. Yeah. So I said, all right, I'm gonna come over there yeah. and we're gonna look at this. And she said, okay, yeah. she opened her door. I went over there and she turned off her light and we stood there in total awe mm -hmm. watching this. Then. As soon as I joined her, another golden disc appeared. First, a tiny little dot, like a star, yeah, yeah. and it like zoomed, and, and it was right that there were twin discs. So if, as if, if there are two people, then there's gonna be two of these objects wow, watching. Wow. And we felt their presence. We didn't say a word to each other, yeah. we just watched it. Eventually, it, these two objects zoomed over us on the roof and we're on the top floor and we heard something overhead pounding and falling and it sounded like something landed 
not only landed. Well, that sounds like an episode of the Twilight Zone. It, I mean, we were, yeah. we we are not easily frightened, yeah. but we were frightened, and you and you heard something oh, get no. out and moving around up there. And there's a there's a ladder that uh, goes to an attic, yeah. and it was it would be possible for something to come down from there. And you know, we're thinking, what the hell is this? And eventually, it ca- the sound calmed down was quiet and then the two discs then zipped back back to where where they were incredibly fast and that was it and we were left stunned frankly wow Wow. now then there's an epilogue to it which made it even all the more remarkable and i i wish i brought it because i have a souvenir of it at that time we had a post box in berlin and i went to just collect our mail for the day Mm. And the way the post office is designed is only the post office worker could gain access to the post box. Right. There's no way to put something into it right. from outside. I opened the box. This is just a few hours after, okay. you know, that was in the middle of the night. Yeah. And then this was early in the morning. The only thing in the post box is a little white piece of paper, mimeographed, that says in German, do ETs exist? And it had a, a crude drawing of a pyramid, a dinosaur, and a UFO. I still have it. And a, and a connection to this crazy website about aliens. So the hours after we had this experience, and mind you, there's no envelope, yeah. so nobody mailed yeah, it. Yeah. Somebody had to be somebody in the post Did office. Did you contact the website? We looked at it. There's nothing to contact. Okay. It was a crude... Like some crazy person yeah. made this website. It's just so I have when it's the unidentified part of flying object. You tell me what that means, yeah, but it, but it was clearly a message from someone mm-hmm. somehow. And then the the most recent though it wasn't as dramatic, but again a lot of people saw it. Actually, and it ties into Charlie when me and Mike Brenner and a few other of Charlie's friends went out to Death Valley after a year after his death on his birth, first okay. posthumous birthday to spread some of his ashes at Barker Ranch yeah. where he wanted them spread. We got lost in Death Valley in a part of a very lunar looking part of Death Valley called Coyote Canyon uh-huh. and we were lost we couldn't find the right route. It was dark. We were exhausted. And we stopped and got out. And if you've ever been to Death Valley, because there's no ambient light yeah. from cities, if yeah. you look up at the stars, you're like on a spaceship. You yeah. see red and purple and green. Yeah. You see outer space. The stars are incredibly bright yeah. and vivid yeah. in a way that they aren't in the city. So we looked up at the beauty of this starscape and we saw a red, again, moving in erratic ways that no human human vehicle can possibly and zipping around and we watched it for many minutes we all watched it again in a state of awe was it large in the sky it was very high up and therefore it must have been very large because yeah. we could see it quite clearly uh-huh. and it was zipping you know and we're looking at this beautiful starscape and and uh-huh. the yeah. it's you know we watched it and we again no explanation yeah. now out there near death valley there's a naval experimental testing ground which you're not allowed to go on so i can't say that it was not a united states weapon possibly but it seemed like it it was way beyond any technology well i've seen some new documentaries where they're claiming that they they've been in touch with aliens and they they're using alien technology but i don't i don't i don't i I I tend not to believe that i i would just say we don't know what the hell it is but it's a real phenomenon and anyone that doubts it if you experience it so we don't know so now we're going to move on to richard ramirez because i'm fascinated by Richard okay. Ramirez and okay. can you tell That's me a logical job. Yeah, UFOs yes, UFO. Well, Ramirez. we don't know about UFOs. So, right. So, right. Uh, right. Well, Richard Ramirez. Yeah, actually, how did you meet him? Um, well, in can ni- you tell me? Yeah, in 1988 during the height of the Satanic Panic, which of course I was a target yeah. <laughs> of these religious right maniacs. Yeah, yeah. I was writing a book that I ultimately never published called The Demonic Revolution that was attempting 
an overview of the occult world, the satanic world, just not not really pro or against, but just saying this is what it really is, yeah. as opposed to the satanic panic, panic, panic yeah. urban legendary. And one chapter, which I wasn't going to shy away from, was about satanic crime, because there are, yeah. of course, satanic crimes, and Richard Ramirez was, was one of them. Absolutely. I mean, he was the, the, uh, the poster boy oh, yeah. for yeah. satanic crime. So I contacted him, and there was, again, the height of this witch hunt hysteria yeah, yeah, so he yeah. knew who i was yeah. and he actually was like a fan because he had seen me on all these <laughs> richard ramirez so, I was mean, your sitting, fan. <laughs> sitting in jail waiting for his trial he had seen me and xena on these talk Next shows show. that we were on at the time and so i said you know i want to interview you for a chapter of this book and he he wrote to me and actually there's a new book that just came out by nico clow brand new book legions of the night it's about richard ramirez's admirers correspondents etc really yeah on the cover and in the book uh i let him reprint the first letter that richard sent to me which has a goetic seal what's One a go these, what is that go well the goetia was a ceremonial magic system in this famous um occult book or grimoire um, the key of Solomon and, oh. the, and the goetic demons are 72 demons that you can conjure with ceremonial magic. So oh. if you look at it, we, we can actually you put can a clip of it that, in yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Where was he in prison? He was in county jail in Los Angeles during his trial, preparing for his trial. So he invited me, and then by the time he invited me, Zena and I had become involved, and of course he knew who she was, yeah. and we went to jail and visited him and got to know him quite well, and eventually he wanted us to write his, or help him write his memoir, his yeah. autobiography, you know, sort of help him polish it, yeah, yeah. And, and because we were sympathetic to him and because we were Satanists at that time. Mm -hmm. He felt we could, and he wanted Zena, by the way, to be um, to be the chaplain who would. He knew he was going to be executed, and he wanted her to be the one who would be the religious representative to take him to the gas chamber. Wow. At that time, did, it didn't happen. Did but, she agree? Or? Oh yeah, she agreed. Uh -huh. She agreed. So we got to know him very well. We interviewed him many times on the phone and in person for this biography, and ultimately. He, uh, like many prisoners, he wanted us to pay an obscene amount of money to his parents, yeah. who, it's interesting to know, he did feel very ashamed and guilty that his Catholic, poor Mexican parents, you know, had to live with the shame, shame. Of, of their son being this hated mass murderer. And he also wanted us to smuggle weed into prison for him, <laughs> which this is at the height of the satanic panic. panic. Yeah. And also like we'd show up at the trial and the news people would recognize us and think, oh, look, it's a satanic conspiracy. <laughs> so, so we got to know him. We got to know him quite well. So how, how did that infringe on your social life? You joke, but it really did. It, it um, did. Well, I mean, at that time, we were being harassed by the Los Angeles Police Department. We often would get stopped by a cop for no reason, yeah, just yeah. to be harassed. Yeah. And I had, all, I, and the year before that, I had all kinds of problems because the Satanic Panic was not a joke. Yeah. If you were a target of it, yeah, they yeah, really right. wanted to fuck up your life. Well, ask, ask the McMartins. Exactly, yeah, you know, exactly. Jesus. Well, we just came a hair away from having that yeah. kind of harassment. Yeah. But we we were in public and we fought back, and Xena especially fought back, yeah. you know, like a lioness yeah. against this. And, I mean, she largely defeated it herself, uh -huh. you know, by, by standing up to it. But as far as impinging on our social life, we had befriended... Uh, one of these satanic panic homicide detectives for the LAPD, yeah. a guy named Pat Matoyer, who was looking like Van Helsing, looking for occult crimes. Yeah. We had to reach out to him and say, look, we are not it's doing crime. anything it's illegal or criminals. Mm -hmm. He ended up befriending us yeah. and saying, well, will you help us solve occult yeah. crimes? Yeah. So he would show us crime scenes that had occult symbolism and ask us to explain it. And we became friendly with this guy who so was So you were like enemy. the Mulder and Scully. 
to a yeah, degree. Right, yeah. I mean, advising him, he was a homicide um, detective did, on... Did you talk to him about what these symbols meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like, it, and for the most part, it was just some stupid stoner putting up a, yeah, something right. they'd seen yeah, on a Led right, Zeppelin yeah. album. But, <laughs> you know, this wasn't the Golden Dawn or anything. Yeah, yeah. But, but at the same time, so at the same time, we knew we were friendly with Ramirez. Richard Ramirez calls us early in the morning when you're allowed to yeah, use the prison point. phone. Early in the morning, he says, guys, listen, someone, some federal guy was here to interview me. And I thought he's here to interview me about other murders. Exactly. He's here to interview me about you guys. And he, and he, I remember Richard Ramirez said to us, we were asleep and we pick up the exactly. phone. There's the night stalker telling us yeah someone's there investigating us and he said this guy's after your ass man you know they're serious was he fbi or was he he implied that he implied right, fbi right, but right. i don't know that he identified himself then did you decide to move to berlin or? we well we actually wanted to leave america anyway and we moved to austria uh -huh. we moved to vienna shortly but, after that would you say very shortly, shortly thereafter after. wow so you got Actually, now that too tied into Charlie. We uh, Fox Television broadcast illegally like nine minutes of my film, Charles Manson Superstar, the raw interview I did with Charlie. Yeah, yeah. They illegally put it up on the 20th anniversary of the crimes without asking me. Could you sue them? And I sued them. I had a very fierce yeah. lawyer who sued the hell out of them. Did you get some money? We got a lot of money and with that we escaped the satanic okay. panic and went to Austria. Wow, so Charlie helped you get out of here. Right, yeah. in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in some strange way he has been a guardian angel <laughs> in our lives. Was there an event or a, a series of events that turned you off to Satan's or turned you around where you said, I don't want to, I'm, I, this is stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. there, there is exactly so that there were a series of events in, in the sort of in the mid to late nineties, I started to see that organizational Satanism and occultism is just ridiculous egotism and narcissism and, hmm. and particularly people uh, trying to get laid. Well, I have no, I, I have nothing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with people trying to get laid, but people, Use people, something. people making up nonsense yeah. and, and living in a delusional fantasy world that had nothing to do with reality and that it was extremely harmful and self-absorbed and, but ultimately not accurate. Yeah. I basically rejected all of Western occultism and these hierarchical groups and organizations, and a big part of what I rejected was my involvement in this group, the Temple of Set. Mm -hmm. And it was just a, a nightmare of clashing egos yeah. and, and petty yeah. feuds over over what title and who is what. Um, yeah, and, and ultimately, I had always been meditating, and I had always been interested in Eastern mysticism, yeah. and sort of and because I had always sort of weirdly promiscuously mixed the two, Satanism and Eastern mysticism, I'd say eventually meditation won out mm -hmm. and and kind of pierced the illusion. How long have you been a Buddhist now? Since the early 21st century. Really longer overall in my adult life yeah. than I was ever a Satanist, but people remember first impressions. Yeah, so. of course I do, yeah. Yeah, so... Oh. so you know, there were many reasons why I rejected it, but a big part of it is not, is because it's it's simply not accurate. The yeah. devil is not what you think he is, yeah. and Satanism is not what you think, think it, it is. is. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We have to hold the book up and get everyone to buy Nicholas Schreck's new Manson file, The Myth and Reality of the outlaw shaman and you should buy it and i want to thank you nicholas for coming by legsville my pleasure yeah to um to well, hang out thank you very much yeah. and thank you to all your viewers yeah. for their attention yeah thank you
Do you want to keep talking about Manson? No, or we... we can talk uh, about any. Well, no. I, I, I think I've said everything I need I to say, say about Manson here. here. Buy the book. Yeah. Um, my, it's my final word. It's, a, and it's Nicholas all in here. Shrek's final word on Charlie Manson.